well, this is kind of a turn up for the books. I have finally, I think, started the, the use of Adobe software. It has been absolutely kicking my ass. Um, so I do apologize for not keeping to an upload schedule, but the amount of times my machine has crashed and I've had to be saved has been a lot. Um, you may hear in the background, I'm being joined by my four-legged friend Kismet, who is breathing rather heavily at the back of the room. So, same process as last time, a bit of a breakdown of the two chapters that I should have released a little before this video. Um, so me, a microphone, five minutes on my phone, and a very quick and dirty analysis of chapters three and four of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So, we start off on chapter three, um, titled Dr. Jekyll Was Quite at Ease, and this primarily is used to juxtapose the two characters, the, the sort of the yin and yang of Jekyll and Hyde. We have Utterson who is starting to really question some of the motives behind what exactly is going on with, with Jekyll, what hold he's got, uh, sorry, what, what hold Hyde has over Jekyll. And he seeks reassurance, he goes to his friend to offer advice and support and help. And of course, we cannot possibly imagine uh, what will transpire later on in the novel, that they are in fact the same person and, and that, that Hyde represents that animalistic, bestial, um, uncivilised nature that Victorians were so scared about. And this is why these two chapters counterpose one another rather beautifully. So in chapter three, we have the reserved, charming, eloquent doctor who is in full control of his faculties, is planning ahead for the future um, and is begging his friends to carry out his instructions should he randomly disappear for set periods of time. So whilst trying to reassure Utterson that nothing is untoward and everything is okay, all he succeeds really in doing is creating a deeper sense of mystery and turmoil within Utterson who is who leaves unsatisfied, even more determined to find out exactly what is going on with his friend. Um, we even have that kind of final Victorian equivalent of a bro moment where Jekyll begs for in the sort of final couple of senses for help and Utterson is forced to acquiesce to the request of his friend and it even says Utterson heaved an irrepressible sigh. Well, he said, I promise. And that's interesting because just before then Jekyll has actually asked him for justice to follow the letter of the law to help the friend that he has identified as his will he can do what he wants and Utterson ultimately is a man who follows law and reason and belief in in some kind of order amongst the chaos of what would be uncivilised life. So as we move into the fourth chapter, which is really if you follow the sort of basics of of, um, of the structure of, of novels, some of you may have heard of Freytag's Pyramid. I did a video a long time ago now it seems um, about that and I'll try and link that if I remember in the, in the video. This is the climax really, this is the point of no return, this is where it doesn't matter what has happened, things cannot go back to a sense of normality. Um, things have to change, the, the entire narrative has to change, there's no going back to that initial pure point. And we have that really nicely contrasted here, we have the appearance of, of Hyde again and he is this complete antithesis to a Victorian gentleman that's counterposed with um, Sadamba's Carew who is described as a beautiful gentleman who was walking through the streets, the exact sort of pretty Victorian gentleman of politeness and, and, and class. And he's observed by, you'll notice this, um, <laughs> by a kind of unnamed woman, and we, we see this throughout Jekyll and Hyde, women don't really feature as characters apart from the massive stereotypes and the vast majority without names. Um, and he actually, Carew sort of is polite and nice to Hyde and Hyde turns around and with an, and, and really interesting here, the, the use of animalistic language, an ape-like fury beats him to death in the middle of the street and runs away. And 
the violence and brutality of murder is, is it wouldn't have been uncommon in Victorian London. In fact, it, the issue is is that this kind of brutality that you would expect with what would be deemed the lower orders or, or sort of the lower classes has happened to such a prominent public figure who is beloved presumably by all. And obviously the link between Utterson and Hyde is cemented even further when we find a letter in Carew's pocket and it leads Utterson to to start to become even more of a detective and involve the police. Um, I don't think I've got much time left, but what I love is, despite the fact it's an urgent case, he still has time to breakfast um, before he goes off and solves any crimes with the policeman. So we now have that beautiful contrast between Jack and Hyde, between the proprietary doctor and the animalistic and evil Hyde. And that's exactly five minutes, so all that's left for me to say is You'll hear from me again soon.